I'll uh, introduce, my <laughs> introduce myself as well. Uh, I'm uh, Philip Papps. I'm a FreeBSD developer. I'm also a director of the FreeBSD Foundation. Um, the FreeBSD Foundation has a booth downstairs. If you are interested in FreeBSD stickers or uh, FreeBSD journal, you should definitely turn up and ask, uh, ask for one or take one if I'm not there. Uh, so this presentation is about uh, modern network servers. Uh, and with network servers, I mean things that you would run inside your network providing uh, network services as opposed to application services. So I'm not necessarily talking about web servers. Uh, but things like uh, authentication services or this particular presentation goes into DNS services uh, and how you would uh, run those on ARM64 rather than running them on AMD64 and you know why you would want to do this. Um, so uh, I originally wrote this presentation for network operator groups uh, so I picked DNS as an example uh, and I got some numbers from the uh, DK Hostmaster. When I say I, of course, is I stole these numbers from someone else who got the numbers uh, from DK Hostmaster. Uh, DK Hostmaster runs the .dk uh, CCTLD, uh, and Denmark is a smallish European country. Uh, they have a s the, the uh, CCTLD zone gets a reasonable amount of traffic, and I think it's a representative example. Uh, top-level domain um, DNS sort of uh, setup. Um, so as of December 2016, so about a year and a bit ago, nearly a year and a half ago, uh, the traffic on the .dk uh, DNS servers was about a thousand queries per second. So compared to say the roots or com or other uh, larger DNS domains, this is pretty much a rounding error. Um, there's about 1.3 million .dk domains in the DK zone. Uh, 11,000 of them are signed, which is actually a f you know, comparatively given the sad state of DNSSEC uh, deployment in the world. And the main effect on this presentation, as I'll show later, is that the DNSSEC signatures do in increase the zone file uh, uh, quite a bit, uh, which I'll talk a bit later about what that affects. Uh, the so zone file size is about 190 megabytes in total, uh, which, you know, 1.3 million domain names. Most domain names will just have uh, one or two NS records and maybe a GLU record, but still the zone file is 190 megabytes text. That's because all of these 11,000 zones have, uh, have DS records as well, and that sort of blows up the zone file size, but not a big problem. Uh, so depending on the name server, they, uh, the zone file, so this 100, 190 megabytes of text, expands to about a gigabyte of uh, space in memory. Yes? Um, do you have a ratio of how much of that 190 megabytes zone size was DNSSEC records versus on the uh, Yes, but do I have it on the slides? No. <laughs> uh, but I would guess... Uh, off the top of my head, I would say about 30% of those 190 megabytes is probably the, uh, the hashes, because you have two hashes and they're fairly large lengths. So I'd say about 30%, but don't shoot me if that's wrong. I can, I can calculate the numbers later on. I, I would say 30%. Uh, but depending on the name server, it expands to about a gigabyte in RAM. So when you load the zone file, the DNS server is going to you know, put it in uh, a format that makes sense to the DNS server rather than to the author of the zone file. So about a gigabyte in RAM, which again is not a very large number, but it's something to take into account. Uh, the CPU load of these DNS servers is approximately zero. So when the zone is loaded, to load this 190 megabytes, expand it, and do all the funny things with it, uh, it gets a little bit of load. But at runtime, the CPU load is approximately zero. The CPUs are not doing much work. Uh, and uh, these DNS servers have about 10 megabits per second of continuous traffic. So not a huge amount of traffic, right? If you have a web server or any, uh, any application service, 10 megabits of traffic is not is not a lot. It, it's just it's a rounding error. So uh, what do the DK people run? They have uh, four unicast servers. I think three of them are inside Denmark, and one of them is somewhere else. Uh, they have seven anycast clouds. So I don't want to talk about anycast too much, but DNS is a UDP service, so it's very easy to uh, anycast it. They have seven clouds, and in total about 120 nodes. So across this entire infrastructure which runs completely on um, off-the-shelf Intel servers uh, with FreeBSD. They see 
resource utilization of about 2 to 5%. So that's all resources like memory and CPUs over this entire infrastructure is about 2 to 5%. So what these machines are doing is mostly heating up the buildings they're standing in. They're not, they're not really doing a lot of work. Um, so let's talk about you know, network servers. What, what do they need to do? Are there, yes? What do you do with the uh, they are using a mix. Uh, they're using a mix of bind, NSD, and I think also knots. Uh, actually, I know for a fact that they also use knots. So it's only uh, the DK zone is only authoritative, so they don't run any unbound, and I don't think they run power DNS. Uh, I don't know. I, I could ask, but I don't know. Uh, uh, but uh, NSD. Um, so when it comes to network servers, the resources they care about in order is. Uh, CPU. So, especially in the case of DNS, you have a lot of really trivial operations running in parallel. Uh, there's no long-running compute tasks. There's nothing to encrypt. There's nothing to decrypt. Nothing to calculate. It's just here's a record. Just send, uh, stick it in a buffer. Send it out on a wire. Done. The CPU just needs to do lots and lots of things and do it all at the same time. Um, memory and bus bandwidth is important. You want you don't want to fetch these things from the disk because that takes time and these, all of this information somehow needs to get into the network as quickly as possible. So the bus bandwidth and the memory bandwidth are important. The network is obviously important, but you know, again, a DNS server, 10 megabits traffic, the network is not hugely important. And then finally, the least important of everything at all is disk I.O. Uh, in the, uh, under ideal circumstances, a DNS server will hit the disk exactly once when it boots, and then it just doesn't hit the disk again. Uh, disk I.O. is just not interesting for network servers. Uh, CPUs are important, bus bandwidth and memory is important, network is important, and the disk is just very unimportant. Um, so historically, there have been a couple of power and high bandwidth CPUs. Uh, Sun tried the T1 uh, processor, which died in a fire. Uh, it just never got off the ground. Uh, Cavium has a moderately successful uh, MIPS implementation, the Oction. It's uh, used by companies like Ubiquiti on uh, routers, um, mostly uh, residential sorts of setups, but they have some larger uh, machines as well. Uh, then there have been things like uh, Tilera, Quanta. They've now eventually ended up with Mellanox, who make 10 gigabits Ethernet adapters, but their CPU just descended into irrelevance after a while. Uh, Intel tried the Atom CPU. Yeah, that was a nice try. Uh, and finally, the ARM, 32-bit uh, ARM, ARM v7, is very popular. It's in, in every phone, or well, every phone as of a couple of years ago. Um, but the architecture I want to talk about is ARM64, which is a new or newish attempt at a server-grade architecture. So ARM64 is widely known as uh, the embedded architecture which lives in your phone, uh, in your tablets. It's just, you know, it's a CPU in your pocket. But it doesn't have to live in your pocket. It can also live on servers. And um, there are a couple of nice things about ARM64 on servers, which is, it's the same instruction set architecture as the ARM64 in your phone, but the way it's uh, laid out on a board and its companionships uh, is a bit different on servers. So uh, the ARM V8 is the same as your phone. It's 64-bit instruction sets. That, that's the same. Uh, it's also the server uh, implementations of ARM64, which are very similar to uh, Intel's AES native instructions, which you find on your Intel CPUs, and on FreeBSD you get pretty similar performance on them as well. <laughs> um, on ARM64 servers, you find the same standardized uh, on-core peripherals like you would find on an Intel CPU. So you'll have uh, things like MSI, message pass interrupts, you'll have a timer interrupt, you'll have an IO MMU. So all those things which are familiar from the Intel world also exist on the AMC64 world. Uh, and uh, for one reason or another, uh, the ARM64 server world also went for ACPI and UEFI on the firmware level, so that all of this is familiar to platform builders on Intel. All of this knowledge can be reused on ARM64. So if you have an ARM64 server board, it will also have ACPI, which can tell you about the hardware configuration uh, and uh, bus topologies and things. And you'll have the UEFI firmware, which allows you to bring up your operating system and loads firmware blocks into various peripherals. Um, and uh, finally, all of the standard uh, peripheral buses, which are familiar from Intel, also just work on ARM64. So you, if you have a PCI Express uh, 
network card that works on your Intel server, you plug it into a uh, PCI Express slot on your ARM64 server, it will work the same. So all of, the, all of these buses are just there. Um, I found a couple of um, commercial off-the-shelf uh, ARM64 server boards. Uh, there's a Cavium Thunder X, uh, the FreeBSD uh, testing cluster has a couple of these sitting there. Uh, the basic implementation has 48 cores and you can have 96 cores. That's a little bit more cores than you would find in a traditional Intel server. Um, it's got 16 uh, PCI Express with three lanes, so it's got pretty pretty good sort of bandwidth to, uh, to the, uh, the external world. And you can get it with uh, 40 gig or 10 gig Ethernet cards. And a board like this will set you back about $3,000. So if you are running uh, CCTLD or you're running any sort of uh, other uh, network service, about $3,000 for a server is pretty much what you expect to pay. You know, depending on uh, how many servers you have or how big your domain is, anywhere between $3,000 and $10,000 is what you would expect to pay for a server. So this, you know, if I were uh, operating a CCTLD, I would go out and buy one of these. No problem. Um, a competing uh, product, though, is a, uh, an AMD uh, design, which has a Cortex A57. It's also an ARM64 CPU. Uh, it's a lot cheaper, so for $600, you can get a four-core device uh, with you know, eight gigabytes of memory, uh, some Ethernet, um, you know, some U USB stuff. So the price goes a lot lower. And between these two, there's a whole spectrum of things. So on the high end, you have the 96-core monsters with all the memory in the world. And on the lower end, you've got you know four cores with a little little bit of memory. Um, so let's look at operating system support for a moment. So on FreeBSD, ARM64 is fully supported uh, platform. So you have uh, binary updates uh, like uh, FreeBSD updates and package uh, are completely supported, just as they are uh, on Intel. Uh, they're also fully supported by uh, the security officer and the release engineering team. So whenever bugs happen they get fixed uh, pretty quickly. Um, and you know, all of the 20,000 third-party packages that work on Intel will usually just work on AMD 64, uh, AMD ARM64, I keep saying that, uh, ARM64 as well. So you can just replace your AMD64 machine with an ARM64 machine without any problem. Uh, and in particular, so for this presentation, I looked at DNS. So uh, the ARM64 platform packages are completely supported by uh, binds and is the not power DNS. So you can just go and package install NSD on an ARM64 server and it will just work uh, out of the box without any, uh, any sort of uh, difficulty. So ransom performance comparisons uh, on a completely fictional uh, workload. So I took an Intel Xeon, I think this is what generation it was, but I had 10 cores uh, with hyper-threading, so 20 cores uh, in total, uh, 128 gigabytes of RAM, uh, and you know uh, an SSD which was moderately fast. This board cost about, and I ran this against the Thunder X with uh, one socket, so 48 cores, same amount of memory, and spinning rust. So similar sort of priced hardware and run an LLVM Clang build. So Clang is a terrible, terrible workload to throw at something. And the Thunder X spent forever on it. So the Thunder X took 32 minutes of wall time or 20 hours of CPU time building LLVM. So the ARM64, you have lots and lots of cores, but they're not very fast. Uh, the Intel uh, CPU uh, managed to get the same workload done in 10 minutes and one hour of CPU time. So it's tw 20 times faster, you would say workload, right? So this is, uh, DNS servers spend very little of their time compiling. So the LLVM workload is lots of continuous disk I.O. As I said at the beginning of my presentation, under ideal circumstances, a DNS server is just never going to hit the disk. It's going to boot from the disk, it's going to load the zone file, and then it will never touch the disk again. Uh, even as the zone updates, you know, new records will come in, but under ideal circumstances, in the steady state, the disk is just never going to be hit. Uh, most of the LLVM time is just loading the millions of C++ files from the disk and compiling them and writing them back to the disk and then loading them back again. Um, the LLVM build has a gigantic memory footprint and a lot of churn, so things coming in and out of memory all the time uh, in different shapes and forms, especially the linker. Uh, and the CPU load can only be uh, slightly parallelized. So the compiler, uh, you're compiling lots and lots of little C++ files, but 
you're not really exercising a lot of parallelism because you're always going to be hitting the disk. So your, your, uh, your opportunities for parallelizing your load are going to be very much limited by how quickly you can fetch things from the disk. And if the disk is slow, you're just going nowhere. Uh, DNS, on the other hand, has a tiny bit of disk I.O. when loading the zone file, and after that, nothing at all. Uh, your entire wor uh, working data set will fit comfortably in memory. So this machine has 128 gigabytes of memory. The zone file is one gigabyte of memory. I can fit 128 Denmarks into memory. You know, call it 127 gigabytes of Denmark in, uh, or 127 Denmarks with you know overhead of operating system. But still, it fits very comfortably uh, in memory. And uh, most importantly, it is very easy to parallelize DNS queries. Yes. I noticed that the on 64 server has a rotary disk only, while the Xeon server has a SSD. Right. And have you, have you considered yes. putting the load into a type of sort? Sure, uh, but it would not it would not change a lot. The it would probably turn it from 20 hours into 18 hours, uh, because the contention is mostly on not using all the cores, uh, because the uh, the way Clang is constructed is it's lots of little C++ files that are linked into smaller object files, and then all of these are linked together. And then finally, you get the last stage, the linking stage, which is where it spends most of its time. The linker runs most, well, it runs on a couple of cores, but the linker runs on very few cores, because there's very little for the cores to do. It needs to resolve some symbols, but then it gets stuck waiting for something else. Uh, so you can't really, you you can't you can parallelize the compilation, but the linking it'll just stop there. Uh, so in that benchmark I did, which was very unscientific, uh, the spinning rust definitely contributed to the slowness, but the 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 major portion of the slowness was just not being able to parallelize the workload because you're just sitting there and not have things to do in parallel, whereas a DNS server. Uh, all it has to do is fetch a record, stick it in a network buffer, and send it out. And not even that, it just has to copy the answer into a record that's already there. So all of this can be trivially done on many, many CPUs at the same time. Um, so that's, you know, that's on the load side of things. Uh, but let's look at more. So uh, Intel servers run very, very warm. So the, uh, the Haswell, which is the last one I looked at in any sort of detail, uh, specifies 135 watts uh, thermal dissipation, idle. So just sitting in your, you just put it in your rack and it's warming up the room uh, with 135 watts doing nothing. Uh, under load, uh, there's 250 watts being produced by the CPU. That's a lot of power. And that's one CPU. Uh, at the same time, you've also got the, the platform, you've got the spinning rust, you've got everything else sitting there. But 250 watts just for your CPU warming up the room. Uh, in some countries, cooling a data center is a matter of opening the window in summer and opening two windows in winter. Uh, in places like Singapore, cooling your data center is a little bit more involved than that. Uh, so if you've got 250 watts just sitting there, or 130 watts just sitting there doing nothing, that's quite a lot of power to dissipate. Uh, if you look at the ARM64, on the other hand, so this is the Thunder, uh, the Thunder X, it's 120 watts, so that's already quite a bit less. And under loads, it's, uh, it's 50 watts less dissipation. And this is a huge, this is a massively over spec machine for DNS. You can run probably on a machine with 20 cores, you can run uh, the DNS as effectively. So this is just the machine I had available. It's 200 watts under loads. It's already 50 watts less. Uh, with four cores, that's, you know, that's not even opening a window in, uh, that's not even opening the extra window in winter. Um, so several vendors have much lower power CPUs. You'll still need cooling than you do with uh, Intel servers. So, uh, so that's worth considering. So on one hand, you've got your server, you're spending money on hardware that's actually doing something. On the other hand, you're saving money on cooling. Uh, and then, well, I had a slight digression on security, which I'm not going to go into uh, in this talk. I added that for another uh, conference. So the conclusions to take away from this talk is that uh, ARM64 is a very viable uh, platform for, ser for network server workloads. So I, I, depending on what your web server is doing, it is probably not going to be very useful for a web server, because web servers do quite a bit of non-trivial calculations, building pages and sending them out. Uh, but if you're uh, network service has a fairly trivial workload, which is easy to parallelize. Uh, 
ARM64 is definitely a better architecture than uh, Intel. So you'll have a machine which is still going to be expensive, but it's actually going to work for its money. And you're going to save a bit of money on cooling it. Uh, so definitely consider ARM64 for your next uh, DNS server. Also, FreeBSD is very well supported on ARM64, so you get all the goodness of FreeBSD on an architecture which works really well for you. And that is the end of this presentation. Does anyone have any questions? I can show it, yes. So when I gave this presentation at uh, Apricot uh, earlier this year about, you know, is, uh, is ARM64 uh, easier to secure than Intel, and we have you know ten minutes of uh, a lightning talk disguised as a question, as uh, these things are known in uh, in that community about uh, what this meltdown and spectral vulnerability are. So it's probably not a huge concern on the NS server. So yes, ARM64 is also vulnerable to speculative execution uh, vulnerabilities. So ARM64 is also an out of order order architecture. ARM64 is equally vulnerable as Intel to stuff ending up in the cache for reasons nobody understands uh, from privileged instructions uh, running, uh, being speculatively executed in underprivileged modes. Uh, yes, they're vulnerable. Also, they've been mitigated in the same way. Uh, but on a DNS server, it's really of least concern. So this is a concern if you've got something like a web server with <laughs> mutually untrusting tenants Running, uh, running on the same machine with a DNS server, you're usually going to have one process running, and that process is just serving public information. So I didn't want that digression here, but you know we've had it anyway. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I think the other way around, DNS over HTTP. Uh, so DNS over HTTP has been a thing for a little bit longer than recently. Um, I've not looked at it too closely. Well, I've looked at I'm, uh, I'm, I'm on the DNS op uh, IETF uh, list. I've not looked very closely at what it is they do, but it should not be a huge problem because as far as I understand it, they are just putting DNS packets into HTTP packets. So they're uh, probably almost as easy, if not as easy, to parallelize as uh, DNS packets in their native formats, either UDP or TCP. Uh, the one thing which is probably different in DNS over HTTP uh, versus DNS over, over UDP, or DNS over DNS, let's say, is that uh, DNS over DNS uh, can be very easily optimized because the response format is exactly the same as the query format. So the DNS server can just keep the buffer uh, in the last level cache and just add uh, the response and send it right back out. Whereas with HTTP, uh, even if I think they run HTTP over UDP as well, but on, on TCP at least, you have a lot more buffers in the way. So you can't just go to this offset, write your reply, and then send it out again because you have a lot more housekeeping to uh, keep up on. Uh, 